are these clubs going to be worth 10, 20 billion dollars? Where's the ceiling? Definitely, there's a huge amount of growth. We spoke on half the world not really being exposed hugely to the mm. Premier League. So there's huge opportunity in that. I mean, we'd have to look to, we can look to the US to some of the franchise values. Um, what is it, Commanders, was it just sold? Or, or is being sold at yeah, $6 billion dollars or yeah. something? And NBA teams, are, you know, no, not an NBA team, less than three, two, yeah. three billion dollars today. It doesn't matter where you are in, yeah. uh, in terms of, of how you're playing. And they're relatively domestic. And they're relatively to... domestic. Jamie, I am so excited for this. We've got Scooter Braun, we've got Dave Clark. I have been told many, many stories. Uh, so thank you first for joining us. You are after those stories. Thank you for having me. <laughs> well, <laughs> let's just yeah, don't listen to a word Dave Clark says. Let's just put that one out there. Wait, at the we're going to leave those for later yeah. in the show. Okay. The, the thing that I want to start with is, you know, we see Newcastle today. Um, I want to start with a little bit of context on you. What did you do before and how did it lead up to Newcastle first? Cliff notes. Sh- sh- sure, absolutely. I grew up in uh, the UK. And around 10 years ago, I started working a bit more actively in the city of Newcastle. Uh, we got involved with the regeneration of the city center. And uh, a lot of friends go to university in Newcastle uh, when I was a kid. So I used to go up there for fun nights out. It was a great city. And so when I started working there, eventually, um, I thought it was a great place to work and a really uh, sort of underpriced in city for what it, what it offered. So um, that's how I got well acquainted with the city of Newcastle. And then by chance, sort of a few years later, the sort of football opportunity came along and I thought it was a great way to sort of elevate the city and, and continue uh, continue what we're doing there. Can I just pick, a, pick something out there for a second? Because you said football you opportunity can. came along. Yeah. And that's always the one uh, from a fan's perspective and I think a general media perspective. We see so much information being spread around uh, takeovers yeah. and how they happen. Every how, day we see it, yeah. How did that actually come about? How do you uh, get the opportunity to get involved? Uh, good question. Actually, um, first look at Newcastle came actually a couple of years before we actually did the deal. Uh, my partners in the consortium at the time, Amanda and her husband, my dad, were looking at putting something together. And sort of we got together and I was sort of looking to help in that respect. And it didn't quite materialize into anything just then. And then a couple of years later, um, you know, she, she, Amanda and Merdad teamed up with the public investment firm and working behind the scenes to get this done and um, sort of approached me again. And, um, you know, being well acquainted with the city and, and also the football club from the previous time we had a look at it, I thought it was a great opportunity and something we wanted to be involved in. Yeah, love it. How, um, how did that process actually like go for you on a time scale phase? Was it quite a long bit in between the first and second approaches yeah. that you had and and then how did I guess the, the group actually operate when the discussions were well, kind of going on yeah no it was it was a couple of years in between but Amanda and her husband never let it go they had amazing tenacity in this deal something they always wanted it's something actually on a personal level because we're friends first yeah. something we always discussed so uh you know but a time went and and they worked tirelessly with with pif behind the scenes to sort of get a structure together and then they approached me and and i thought it was a, a great opportunity i thought i could add value and so it's something we wanted to do can i dive in you see like uh, 300 million is like the price tag how is that structured like sorry who like puts up the cash i'm really naive here but it's like pif amanda you I, I, as a consortium we're, we're investors and we all put up money so you all put money into like a, a fund and then the fund buys yeah, it an S- yeah as, as, as SBB, exactly. Got you. Okay, that makes total sense. And what does that process look like? You said like, hey, is there a bidding process? Because I actually had Steve Pagliuccia uh, on and he talked about kind of the bidding process for Chelsea, which you know, we sadly lost for him. Um, <laughs> that sounds a bit harsh. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, <laughs> but um, they, how does that bidding, are you fighting against other people to buy it? Well, this was done through a private sale. I mean, Chelsea was a very clear public auction with what happened after the sanctions and there was a lot of interest. Um you know, the former owner of Newcastle had some offers throughout the years, but they never quite materialized. And as you said, you'd read every day of another offer. We didn't know how many were true, how many were not. So it wasn't really much of a public auction. I think uh, Amanda who led this sort of uh, gained the former owner's trust and sort of a deal was worked out sort of privately with them and, and, and also with the public investment fund. So it was mostly done between them, but it wasn't like an auction in the sense that Chelsea, or Manchester United, Rain weren't hired to go market at the club like they are now. So it was done in a more private manner. You mentioned the personal side. How much of it was actually a business decision as well? Uh, look, I, I'd be lying to say it's, if it's not a, an amazing, it's, you know, as a sports fan, it's not something I'm so happy to be involved in. Yeah. It's really a, an exciting business for us. But, you know, sports as a, is, as a business is something I'm involved in. You know, we're involved in, a, in, a, in the Britain's largest horse racing business. 
So it's something I understand, it's something I enjoy, but I think something that ultimately can be financially lucrative as well. Yeah. Can, can I ask, when we see like the prices of sports teams, like feels like a really good deal, respectfully. You see Chelsea at whatever it was, two two point five. With you know, it, it seemed like a strange structure. The Chelsea deal, two point was it two point five? Was it two point five committed yeah. over ten years? How is that being committed? Who's holding them to that? Yeah, Man U right now, you know, going through the same process sure. with the Rain Group for six billion supposedly. You know, how is that where it's got up to now? Yeah. Supposed, I mean, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Again, who knows? We yeah. get we get so many figures thrown around, but it looks like that's the number that they're, they're yeah. throwing out there. Again, all due respect to Bournemouth, Premier League football club, one hundred and fifty million for for them when maybe the assets that they hold. Um, on maybe as strong as what as what you have in Newcastle. So, you know, three hundred million. If you're looking at all of those from the top and the bottom, does seem yeah like a, uh, a great deal. It is, I, I think I think on, on on you know considering where Chelsea and maybe Manchester United go, it certainly looks like a a decent price. Uh, but it's not the total picture. That's just the purchase price. Yeah, comes in investment in not just players but into possible one day stadium expansion, a new training ground. Women's football team, academy, all of these things uh, at the moment require you know a big upfront investment as well. So while three hundred is a is it seems like a, a relatively good price in, in in the comps today, there's also other investment that you've got to count in as well. But we're happy with where we are, and, and, and we think we've got a good chance. Of... It feels like entry fee to a nightclub. You know, you pay like twenty. I know which nightclubs and, you're going to. I'm going to say far away from them. Yeah. You mentioned your Newcastle right. days, um, but I, I do have yeah. to ask, um, like, what does that look like in terms of ongoing costs? Like, it does that, how's that split? Like, how much does it cost to run a football club? Well, it, it's 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 a correlation of what you're willing to, uh, what your goals and ambitions are. So if you want to elevate the team, we've seen uh, transfer prices keep going up. Um, so it costs money to bring in players. And it seems like that will continue to go up. Uh, there might be blips, but, you know, uh, that seems to be on an upward track. And then, look, in order to make, uh, to meet fa uh, financial fair play, which we're adamant, we're going to do. We're, we're going to play by the rules, and we're going to. We're long-term investors. You know, you need to invest in your stadium. You need to invest in your infrastructure. You need to invest in other non-footballing uh, parts of your business yeah. to get the commercial revenue up, in order to sort of financially invest on the pitch and mm -hmm. sort of elevate your status. Yeah, which is um, which is a, a longer-term play. I think yeah, just picking up. You mentioned financial fair play, and I'm sure it'll come up a, a few times, but. It's something it's been again, mentioned once or twice, oh, yeah. <laughs> especially I'd imagine from the outset really, right. when you know you look at obviously a big takeover and expectations change within fan bases and the media starts putting out a lot of speculation around who could potentially be coming into a club, whether that's from a management perspective or a player's perspective. But from your side, when you bought the club, did you all have an idea of how you really wanted to run this, both I guess short, medium and long term? Because the reality of the club you took over, even in the year and a half or, yeah. or so to now, is is different to, to where we find ourselves immediately. And we look and we think that's worked very well. Did you know what you wanted to do from day one? Yeah, we, we, we had a vision uh, of where we wanted to get to. Um, and we're aware of the FFP constraints um, from the beginning. You know, we, we, we take our reputation seriously, as does everyone else in the consortium. And we thought, there is a way by being prudent and by being strategic to get the way, to get to where we need to within the FFP uh, rules, and that's what we've set out to do. It definitely means a longer term strategy than many. Than you know, maybe some people thought we'd just come in and sort of blow away the league. That's never been our style. We want to do things in the right way, uh, patient way. We obviously want uh, the football team to be playing at the top levels of yeah. international football. Of course, we do. But um, it will take uh, some time to get there, and I think you know FFP has. There's a reason why these people, uh, why these rules were brought in, yeah. to create some sort of fairness, and I think that's a good thing uh, for for football. It is a challenge, but we'll, it's a challenge we'll meet. Do you mind actually? Just, sorry, just quickly, just on we, we talk about FFP, and I think just clarify, you know, financial fair play. How how does it actually work? So basically, it's on a, it's on a on a revenue basis. So it, the, the basic idea, without getting too technical, is so you don't you, it's the amount you can spend is linked to your revenue. So it doesn't mean a club without the revenue without the success can just come in and, and blow away uh, a, a league. Yeah. And so um, the idea is to grow the business side and the non football side as well. Um, and sort of like things investment into women's football into academies those don't count towards your FFP. So yeah. it's heavily incentivized to invest in the infrastructure. Of, of your football team. You mentioned the cost of players going up there. We always used to be addicted to football manager. 
Um, I, I was addicted. I mean, this yeah, game is exactly. just like you know absorbed most of my childhood. Uh, until um, I started cheating, it was a great. Oh, I did too. Yeah, stress to me. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He was like, "Oh, you cheat!" And he was so <laughs> right. morally like, yeah. "High and proud." Oh God, no, I cheated. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but although the cheating never <laughs> actually worked. Did you notice this? Like, you buy amazing players and never actually led to great uh, things. Well, because you were you went down the wrong avenue. You were what really you can do is sell your players for inflated transfer fees. Take over two clubs. Exactly. Yeah. Sell. Exactly. Pull out with Simon Ronaldinho. <laughs> so I had 80 million pounds to spend. It's fantastic. I always remember with that though, and, and again, this is something that you, you maybe start to understand a bit better, but then it was you, the, the spread payments. Mm -hmm. And you'd always want the payments up front always. because you wanted it to go into your immediate yeah. transfer. Oh, right. yeah. no. oh, I hate when they came with like 2 million up front yeah. and then 20. Uh, 20%, backwards. I would yeah. meticulously <laughs> check the top seller. Like the computer wasn't tracking for me. Um, um, my, my question is not, is that more like real life? Well, I mean, that's kind of an interesting one, but like when you, you said about players and like the cost of players, is. Does one literally like set a transfer budget for the manager and say, "Here's a kitty"? I'm just always intrigued. Like, how do the managers it's, interact it's a, with you? A quite, quite. It's, it's actually a quite a detailed. Uh, it's quite a detailed procedure. So, I mean, the, first of all, we have amazing executives in the club. They'll outline weaknesses or strengths or things we need to work on and things we need to add, um, and then they will provide a list of uh, possible recruitment uh, candidates in, in different positions. And then as a board, we'll take a decision to strengthen X amount in X areas uh, this year. You know, it, not, 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 you don't have to totally uh, change, revamp your squad every year. If the idea is to bring, mm -hmm. you know, some key players, you know, um, and continue to improve your team, but also to improve the players you have as well, which our coach has done fantastically. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's quite a strategic, uh, it's quite a strategic procedure and a lot of things on data science and a lot of data behind not only players you're looking at, but also what your team is doing at the moment. So is that like is that an, an Eddie and in, into Dan Ashworth that then yeah. gets brought the, the, to you? Uh, yeah. Is so uh, the, the football the footballing team will 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 have detailed conversations before it gets to the board about which areas they think they can strengthen, possible targets they like, um, and that will all be backed up by the data. Actually, our chairman of the team, Yas, is the, probably the most data driven individual you've ever met. Really? He really is instilled. Uh, into this club, a discipline of, of getting all the facts and all the data first. And I've learned a lot from that. And so we see an incredible amount of data, more than I've ever seen in any other business. So, so, sorry, I do want to ask, because obviously I had tech invest. Um, and I've tried selling to football clubs before with a lot of different you know, data platforms in, in yeah. many different aspects. And respectfully, it's been a pretty hard sell and a pretty hard customer education process. Yeah. Like, is that unique to Newcastle? Do you think most clubs are data first now in terms of how they buy players hot like grow it's get, it's getting there for, for, uh, i'm not sure it, it's been a hard process yeah. uh um but it's something we put first mm. uh and i think that is something that could potentially give us an edge um and i think it's very very important you know obviously there's data gets you so far you know the character of the player has to fit into the dynamic of the dressing room you know eddie howe's very uh, particular about the type of player he, he brings in. You know, they must fight for the team. They must be a team player. Um, and so we have a bunch of amazing characters and that really helps us. You know, uh, they work tirelessly. They give everything on the pitch and they love the city and they love mm. the club. And so data is so, so important, but also the character of the individual as well. Yeah. You don't want to upset the dressing room. You don't want to change a dynamic. So you have to be very particular about the character you bring in. That's something I've learned as well and something I really respect and appreciate now. Well, I guess if you, you know, if you start with the data, at least it identifies yeah, the exactly. ball down to then sure. bring the opportunity to, exactly. to, to to assess the cultural value. That's right. Um, and I think, you know, if you look at a few of the players you brought in, you can see that straight away because you look at, uh, you know, I hear so much from Dan, Dan, Dan Byrne. Byrne. Yeah. yeah. Get me suit measured. Oh, get me. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So Dan yeah. Byrne uh, brought in last from January. From Blythe. Yeah. And yeah. he used to play for Fulham. But he's, he's extraordinary because he's, um, he's, he's been incredibly effective wing back. Well, I say... You know, yeah, centre back or wing back. Centre back or wing back. But, but he's six foot eight. He's six foot seven. Six foot seven. He's There's the still tallest player for you. I know. Yeah. <laughs> At one, one point, we, we have actually, the, I think, the tallest player in the Premier League and the shortest player, Ryan Fraser. Ryan Fraser. Short, yeah. So um, I remember they were there was a picture of them walking out and uh, and uh, and Kieran Trippier put on his Instagram. It was nice for Dan Byrne to bring his son out yeah. for the day. <laughs> uh, which, was well, quite, which was quite funny. It looks brilliant. Yeah. Um, but I guess, you know, if, if you look at those players, it comes back to the first thing I was referencing, which was the expectation labeled on Newcastle post takeover. 
and you know, I think everyone was expecting your Lewandowski's and your Mbappe's to, yeah. to be in the papers rather than your Kieran Trippier's, your Dan Burns, the Chris Woods yeah. um, of the world that actually, by the sounds of it from your side, were very strategically targeted to fit a specific mould to meet the objectives that you'd set. Yeah, no, I, I think there was that expectation. I think the problem with that expectation is, is not what we communicated, that this was a long-term investment strategy. Secondary, we're also at the bottom of the league or second bottom mm -hmm. from the league. The only team in English football as of December last year not to have won a game. Um, and it was uncomfortable viewing, especially for the new ownership. It was supposed to bring a, you know, a sweeping change oh. in uh, what does that fortunes. Feel? What does that feel like? You're it, sitting in the stands. It's it, like, oh, God. It, it, um, you, you know what? I'm thankful we had that experience because nothing today will ever yeah. uh, replicate the nerves uh, I had. And especially the uncomfortableness yeah. I had. You know, when we weren't winning a game, here we come, you know, a new Newcastle, and then we, we can lost and lost and lost, or, we, or drew and drew and drew. We didn't win. And uh, the fans were terrific. They, they gave us unbelievable support. But I remember very vividly, it was we were 1-0 up against Norwich, who were a challenger for, for uh, relegation as well at the time. And uh, we were 10 men down. We managed to find ourselves a goal up. We scored a penalty or something. And, and I remember the 70th minute, actually having heart palpitations thinking you've got to like mapping out my exit strategies trying to find the nearest st john's and yeah. <laughs> like, it was so nerve-wracking um and not wanting to bring it up they did equalize they, they did they yeah. did equalize and they almost had a good opportunity to <laughs> go. yeah, I know. yeah. yeah. Sorry. so we found a you know my dad and is is a our Kona and friend of ours or we found a new way of sort of dealing uh with this which is sort of heavily drinking before oh. games yeah we have a ritual now that we dare not <laughs> dare not miss uh, and the trouble is, is it's working and so you have to keep you have to yeah. Yeah. and the games not. are getting earlier yeah. like i do i want to do a double tequila shot uh, <laughs> one no but does the team need me yes absolutely i was right. wondering why dave clark's right. so insistent on going with yeah you. exactly <laughs> yeah. that's amazing we spoke about kind of the, the changing mindset of like football clubs in terms of data first approaches yeah i think the role of owners has changed so much how do you reflect on like the role of owners changing and what the role of an owner really means to you today as an owner Sure. Uh, you know, when I was following football as a kid, I'm sure you guys were as well. I mean, you, you, the way you, you would get involved in a club is to look at teletext on the score, mm -hmm. collect a, a sticker. Yeah. That whole thing's gone out the window now. Yeah. It, with, with social media, fans want to be totally immersed in, in the day-to-day -day decisions of the club and, and who's running them. And ultimately, as a board, we, you know, we're the ultimate set the ultimate responsibility and the strategic uh, focus going forward. So they want to understand what the owners are about. Uh, the first thing you want to understand is why do you own this football club? Do you love this football club? Do you understand that it's not really yours? It's really ours. We're letting you own it for now, but this club ultimately belongs to the city, the community, and the fans of, of Newcastle. We're just custodians. I think we made that clear. We, we, we definitely got that, um, and we definitely respect that. Um, and number two, they want to understand what your vision is, You know, you know especially with the uh, cost of living and everything today. The fans give up a great deal of time and money to come support uh, their team. Newcastle, for example, every away game is like going to an international game. So far, yeah. uh, you know, we don't have too many neighboring Premier League teams. So they have to cross the country, uh, you know, mostly every week. And that's a big ask. So in return, they want to know that you're going to, you're, you're out to deliver, you know, success in the future and that you, you love and care about this club. And the thing as owners, we have to, we have to, we have to respect that and communicate that. In terms, sorry, I'm, I'm jumping, but in terms of communicate Come that, like, do you think it's important then that owners are much more public in terms of their profiles, in terms of uh, espousing that vision, that passion? You know, sitting behind, you know, the ivory tower now um, might be nice, but maybe we need to be a bit more public. I mean, the ivory tower has some definitely have some advantages. Um, I, think, <laughs> uh, uh, I, look, I think it's important to keep like, uh, open lines of communication with the fans as owners. I don't know, you, we have, you know, I say this with a with a with a camera crew right here. I don't know <laughs> if you have to live a reality Seattle Vision lifestyle. You know, I think we it can be measured, uh, but I do think you have to keep it uh, keep lines open to communication, not only in the good times, bad times as well. Um, and so, roles of owners are changed, and that the the profiles are definitely changed as well as football has evolved into a not just a local regional sport. You know, with what's happening with Wrexham and Ryan. You know, mm -hmm. these are these are big franchises. Premier League's a big name around the world. Um, I was such a man we, crush on Ryan Reynolds. This guy is a he's, freaking he's, hero. Yeah, he's a hero. What, what they've done there, I mean, it's just incredible. Incredible. I mean, Have you guys been watching? Yeah. And, wow. uh, and I found myself watching on BT Sport on wow. weekends. And, you know, you, okay. you, you're genuinely sitting there and remembering what products you're then watching on BT Sport. Yeah. 
And with all due respect to the conference, it's not something I've no. watched previously when it's been on TV. No. Yeah. It's actually, I think, what's amazing about that is it's the appetite of the area and the town. And I guess, yeah. you know, how they've taken them in, but also how Ryan Reynolds and Rob... Uh, yeah, they've have, have embraced the culture, right? ...understood yeah. what it's all about. And I guess Definitely. that's to your point. You know, I'm always having that level of understanding and connection with a fan base that makes them feel involved. And it, it always interests me a little bit because sometimes when owners do start then communicating or maybe they do something that, that shows they care or, or speak to the fans in a different way, quite often it can lead to a lot of criticism, whether it's sure. coming out on Twitter. And, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know how you view kind of a social media as a platform to to engage. I saw you uh, put a nice plea out to get Joe Willock in the uh, yeah. English, which I think yeah. lots of people after that pass could... Uh, right, <laughs> could yeah. over agree. to you guys, yeah. Okay. yeah. But I don't know how you view the kind of social media platforms sure. as, a, as an area of engagement or if it's through different forms of um, communication that, that also present opportunities? No, that's a good question. I think uh, Twitter is definitely a good way of communicating. Um, you know, social media is becoming increasingly important. Also, as a club, you want to elevate a status on social media. Mm -hmm. That means more people watching, more people knowing about you that can lead to increased revenue. So. So it's an important way of communicating, but it's also an important way of building your, your brand as well and taking that international. There are definitely other ways of communicating. We went on a trip to Saudi Arabia. We met the fans. Uh, you do these fans forums. So it's, so it's important to do something publicly and also smaller things as well, where you can probably understand more about sort of concerns from the fans and yeah. things like that. I think both are important to do. You speak about data with players. Mm -hmm. What about data with fans? How are you? How are you tracking? How are you oh, looking at that kind of global presence now? We, we're definitely, definitely tracking. Um, I think that uh, Newcastle had an amazing sort of local fan base. It seemed to be always everybody's second team, yeah. but internationally, you know, maybe not as well recognised as the Liverpool's, the Manchester United's, the Chelsea's, and so we have a big chart, big chance, and and it's a big aspiration of ours to build our, our brand globally and attract. Um, more fans uh, from around the world. It's why we're doing a tour of America in July. It's why we've done a couple of tours of the Middle East. Um, so we see a big opportunity uh, in expanding our, our, our global fan base. Why, why do you choose America in the Middle East? Is it, sorry, is it, is it purely an economic decision of like GDP per head and how much one can spend and how much a viewer is worth? Like, is it like, why not LATAM? Why not other parts of Asia? I'm just intrigued. So uh, it's a good question. Definitely that, uh, you know, purchasing power by head, that these are important uh, dynamics to consider. I think that um, in terms of Middle East, maybe they have a, they love football. And, you know, up until recently, perhaps their local, uh, the local leagues haven't been sort of to the standard of the Premier League mm -hmm. or La Liga. So there's been a huge amount of uh, viewing of English Premier League. So yeah. it's important to go reinforce that. And we see what's happening in America as well. MLS is really growing yeah. and taking over taking off and, and it provides a huge opportunity. But maybe there is a chance in uh, to go to Mexico and to Brazil and and and, uh, and and do things there as well. If you need someone to come to Tulum with you, I'm, I'm happy. That, to I, that was going to be, I was going to ask. I'm here, yes. Jamie. You're you're okay. I'm here. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of, sorry, I, I'm also like just intrigued. When you look at like the MLS and you look at Saudi uh, and kind of the region, do you think they import foreign brands and foreign leagues like, you know, the Premier League and like La Liga and like, other famous leagues or do you think they build them internally with you know Ronaldo joining you know the league or with the MLS itself which one do you think dominates over the years domestic or international import I think I think in the Middle East definitely up until a few years ago sort of exclude Saudi from this conversation because they, there's not a huge amount of population in mm. UAE and Qatar yeah. and they do a good job at promoting football they did a great job at the World Cup but they, they, there's not an amount of know, 400,000 people and something in Qatar, it's hard to create a, a big football culture and local level uh, to really compete and sort of with global leagues. I think Saudi with its bigger population, love for football has a has an opportunity to build sort of a, their own version of the Premier League. I see what's happening now. You know, people are tuning in, you know, to sort of Al Halal uh, and teams like that, yeah. Al Nasser uh, with the teams like Ronaldo, you know, interesting to see where Messi ends up next as well. Um, I think they have a very good chance of creating like an organic uh, league that, that could become a, 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 a big uh, global force for football in the, in the years to come. They're a football population mad. Uh, so there's an opportunity there. And in the US, I think, you know, historically, they've tried to sort of bring players at the end of uh, their careers in Europe to play in America to yeah. sort of elevate the game. 
Uh, will be interesting to see now. Maybe people have a look at um, America early on in their career. Mm. Liz Groenga, our, our CEO, came from Atlanta. You know, the average attendance there is almost over 50,000 for every home game. Wow. So you will see, it'll be very interesting to see what happens with MLS in the next couple of years, uh, you know, especially with Miami. And and uh, I was speaking with David Beckham and in Miami a, a month or two ago, and he was he was blown away by the opportunity of the MLS and, and, and the love for it as well. So be interesting to see. Well, I think you look at um, some of the leagues as well. And you mentioned, obviously, the bringing of the names into the league, but you only have to look at what happened in the World Cup and that incredible result yeah. for Saudi Arabia against Argentina. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'd imagine that sent ripples through. Yeah, it, it did. My, uh, yeah, definitely. My partners in the team were, 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 were very happy with that. Um, and you know what? They, they look like they have a really good team. Mm -hmm. um, the Newcastle did play Al Halal uh, a couple of months later. Al Halal has a lot of Saudi national players, and, yeah. and we did win quite comfortably. But who's keeping score? Um, well, exactly. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, but it, you know, it, do you think you gained or lost fans through that game? <laughs> yeah, we, we're down three days. <laughs> yeah. 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 Guys, right. lose. Yeah. Yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> um, One day meet in the Club World Cup, maybe. Yeah, right. You never know. Exactly. Uh, no, we're going to have the same result anyway. So, you know, it's. It'd be, it'd be, I think part of the, the excitement of football yep. is the unknown. And the fact that a team like Saudi Arabia can go and beat the World Cup winners uh, in the first game is what makes uh, football so exciting. Yep. You know, the fact that a Leicester City can win the Premier League when they're odds on to be mm. relegation. The fact that Newcastle United can be competing for the Champions League when, you know, we were fighting for relegation last season. That the element of surprise, I think, makes the Premier League... Um, uh, or soccer in general, um, just unparalleled to any yeah. other sport. I think it's a good time to to touch on the media rights that currently exist, obviously, within the Premier League. So correct me if I'm wrong, we have domestic rights and yeah. then we have international rights correct. packages. Yeah. How are they currently negotiated with the teams? And, and how much of a say do you have in that process as a group of, of 20 independent clubs? So, so the Premier League negotiates as a block. Um, with uh with with those trying to buy the content so obviously the premier league has a each club has a voice in the premier league panel amanda stably represents us in that and she'll give her opinion on the packages being negotiated and how we approach that but i think it's a good thing the premier league go and negotiate as one block rather than 20 fragmented yeah. uh in, yeah. uh you know individuals yeah. we've seen the same in racing uh you know we we R R racing perhaps didn't get as good of a deal from its media rights in previous years because each track would negotiate its own set of rights with the content buyers. Mm -hmm. What we're able to do is accumulate, you know, an, a substantial amount of British racing that we can talk as, you know, 50% now of British racing when we go. And that gives you more clout. And ultimately, that's good for the game. The more money that goes into yep. uh, into the into the sports, we found to prize money to grassroots racing or grassroots football. Um, so uh, the Premier League, I think, does a good job in negotiating. Um, and they've definitely, you know, got a good couple of results last yeah. time. So we'll see if hopefully that continues. And look, I mean, I, I guess compared to some of the other leagues, it's, it's part of the reason why, you know, financially the Premier League can often throw its weight around maybe because yeah. it's able to negotiate a lot of these rights. Yeah. But uh, one thing that's, that's always seemed quite interesting is, you know, the innovation around rights packages and content. And we're seeing this a lot more yeah. right now. So. It's been mentioned, it's been talked of, the kind of Netflix-style subscription model um, taking control of the rights and, and almost packaging them on a Premier League platform. Mm -hmm. You have your library of content alongside sure. the live piece. You know, there's more of a subscription fee because as fans at the moment, you know, oh, the, the packages across your BT, your Sky, it, your Amazon Millions Prime, of subscriptions, right? yeah. It's just, right. it's, it's crazy and it's very expensive and, mm -hmm. and, and you have to have so many of them to mm -hmm. access all those games. Do you think that's a, a genuine possibility? I mean, technology aside, do you think it would make sense to create a platform that that does actually uh, sit within kind of its own um, its own process? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, certainly a lot of the American owners will, will tell you yes. Uh, the Todd Bowley's of the world have been very successful at, at things like that. And that's sort of the vision I know he he sort of would share for for the Premier League. It is it is kind of crazy that we that you know at three o'clock on a Saturday we can't watch our team. Nuts. Nice. Like that that that's and you be, can in other countries. And you can in, yeah, yeah. In, in America yeah. where I sort of live half the year, every game yeah. uh, I can watch. But I come to 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 England if I don't go to the game, uh, we can't watch it and. That that science that seems to be a bit antiquated to me. Um, so there may be a role for that in, in the future. Just you know, 
you know, these 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 was brought in to ensure that fans went to the stadiums. Yep. I mean, the, the passion uh, for football amongst fans, they're going to the stadium, whether it's on television or not, you know, yeah. you know, a game of four o'clock on a Sunday isn't, you know, less filled out than it would be at a three o'clock kickoff. So I just I just think that, that, that the system has to has to continue to change. Yeah, I mean, look, the party line, as you say, is always the protection of attendance. And this is much, I guess, for the lower leagues. The lower that, leagues. That, that's what they really But maybe there's something on, we can it? do in the lower leagues mm -hmm. or up to a, to a certain point, or at least give it a trial. Yeah. Um, but we should give fans the access to watch, uh, watch the team, especially, you know, it, it, we talk about it is expensive, obviously, these subscriptions, but also, you know, so is transportation across country yeah. to a, so is a, a, a match ticket. We need to give people sort of a range of uh, options to go and support their team. Can I ask you, and uh, you're probably both going to kill me, so, you know, VC, We're never. VC in the room. The VC how, much you, how much does, like, do you get from the media packages? Like, do, do the, you know, does, does Amanda come back and say, like, oh, we got you know, 20 million, or oh, we got 100 million? Like, how does that actually look? And how much do you make? So it, it depends how, what the suitcase she has on that day. So she'll come in with a big pot of cash. I'm, I'm teasing you. Uh, the, <laughs> the, I was genuinely yeah. like, oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah it is. Yeah. Oh. You sold it, yeah. man. Yeah. Uh, I sponsor the suitcase? Uh. So it's a much less <laughs> exciting, but each uh, club gets the exact same amount from the Premier League through the distribution. doesn't matter whether you finish 20th, we finish first, everyone gets a um, a certain amount. Gosh. And then it's performance related after that, right? And the, yeah, sort of yeah. then, well then each club's on its own in terms of how it grows its own commercial revenues, where it places in the league, there'll be extra Is that money fair? for that. Like if you think about like a meritocratic society or like league, you know, bluntly, the people who deliver the most like net income or net subscribers or net fans technically bring the most value. Should they not be compensated more by any meritocratic system? We're looking at you for this. <laughs> I mean, my, yeah. my argument would be that it, it actually creates strength within the league. Yeah. Because I think that's the, right. the the more money the the teams down the bottom of the leagues get, the more competitive the whole league becomes. And I think, again, sorry, that's not, not my question probably to answer, but if you look at some of the... Sorry, I'm just the writing this leagues, down. With, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if you look at some of the other leagues within Europe and you're talking about the domination of a Bayern Munich or a Real Madrid and Barcelona, it's generally because the financial distribution isn't equal. And you look at La Liga revenue splits and outside of... Real Madrid and Barcelona, you then have Atletico that sits maybe, you know, two thirds there. And then it's, I mean, you're you're going 100 million below what some of the, the top teams yeah. are getting. Look, the Premier League is the best league in the world. There's a reason for it. Uh, you know, two years ago, six clubs decided to sort of take your view that it's not fair and try to break away into a sort of super league. Mm. I actually uh, secretly led that consortium. Yeah, I, I, knew it. It. Wow. I knew it. I knew it. I saw a mug downstairs <laughs> saying breakaway six. Um, so, so they obviously might have agreed with you. I, 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 I tend to agree that I think that the, the league in general, a stronger league in general, um, positively affects clubs both at the top and bottom end of that spectrum. So it allows for you to 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 to, to do what you're almost doing. Also, if it if it ain't broke, it, you know, why, if it's not broke, why fix it? Mm. You know, like the Premier League is the best franchise and the best league in the world, so it's clearly working. Yeah, for all its madness, it is. But I think. Um, you know, you just, just there is still performance related parts to it. Huh. <laughs> so, you know, it, yes. the, person, the person that wins the Premier League still gets more money than the, the, the team that finishes bottom. There's just a set percentage that is distributed evenly. And am I right in saying yeah. international rights are even? Oh, uh, yes, exactly. And so, for example, like if you finish first, you get a lot more money from the Premier League than if you do finish 20th. Totally. But yeah. the, the actual media money is, is, a, is a set but amount. I, I'm naive here, which is, you know, a wonderful place to be in life. Um, but like, do you get like 10 million, like 20, like what, what, what are the ranges? Just help Vastly me out. It's over 100 million. So over 100 million if you win the league. Oh, so if you know, this is- um, 160-ish, isn't it? The, yeah, this is for, for media rights, it's a set amount. Oh. So per place, it's a, set, it's a set amount. For each place you go up, it's an extra amount. I don't know what it was for this year, but uh, probably with that, I probably should find out. No, yeah, yeah well, exactly. exactly. You're going to have yeah. this. It's going to be good. Well, I, think, exactly. I think it's around 160 right. million. I'm just wondering if it scales in accordance to player value <laughs> accretion. Like when you look at the price of players going up. This is definitely the VC in you. We're, we're, we're light years behind in terms of that. Do you see yeah. what I mean though? Like if right. This is where the show gets exciting. Yeah. It, yeah. If right. the supply of talent price goes up, then you know, yeah. bluntly it should increase in price for you to bluntly be able to finance that. No? Yeah, and, and actually, one of my main questions to you was, you know, you mentioned the transfer market, and I d it does feed into this. Do you, know, do you think it's actually sustainable when you look at some of these prices? And obviously, then you're in the weeds of the finance in the club, and you're looking at your financial fair play model. 
can you get the players and or at least the number of players that genuinely uh you know you need within the kind of transfer market uh boundaries that were currently set uh it's possible it's definitely challenging i think you it, it's a balance i think you first of all it just shows the importance of bringing your own players through mm -hmm. uh that is that it's the only viable way of running a football club is to have a good group of young mm -hmm. players coming into your team but in terms of FIFA play, yeah, we have to be smart, you have to be shrewd, and you have to be opportunistic. Yeah. Uh, you have to be ready to pull the trigger quickly. You have to know what you want. And um, you have to be strategic. And a lot of thought gets into who to approach, why they're approaching them, what are the best chances um, of, of success. What you don't want to do is sort of make a ton of blanket offers and, 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 and you know, got to be quite controlled, disciplined. Yeah. Um, but it's definitely challenging, especially with uh, some of the other clubs. You've seen the sort of the months they've spent. Uh, financial fair play means we can't do that uh, just yet. And so we have to make sure our, our pound really has to go further mm. than a Manchester City, a Chelsea or a Liverpool. What do you think about how they've spent and how they've transacted? Well, you know, they're, they're, for, for their, they're both friends of mine and, and, you know, off the field, I definitely <laughs> wish them the best. Uh, they've definitely brought in some very, very good players. Uh, it's a shame it hasn't worked out uh, for them, uh, but it can. It can. It can next year. That's such a back Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's bought great players. Shame it hasn't worked. No, they, uh, they, they definitely, they, they, you said that. No, they definitely brought in some very high quality players. And you know what? It can change on a dime. Last year, we yeah. were fighting relegation. This year, we're, we're, we're we're pushing towards a Champions League space. So, you know, next year, I wouldn't be totally surprised to see Chelsea pushing on. Uh, and so it, it can change very quickly. But definitely they spend a lot of money and that's, uh, you know, it, that that's a, that would those sort of sounds would be difficult mm. for us. But bringing it back into you, you know, your business of sport, what's, what's interesting um, about what Chelsea seem to have done is start really using, um, do we, I don't know, we can call it a loophole, but it's always been there. It's just putting players on longer contracts and amortizing a transfer fee over a longer period of time to be able to then comply with financial fair play. Yeah. UEFA have already come in, I think. And, yeah, they're and looking at it. And saying, we, you know, we're, we're not going to do that. You can From next season, of, right? From next season, I think. Yeah. And yeah. so ultimately, you know, <laughs> tying players to long term contracts for massive transfer fees. Uh, is something they've done very quickly and, and won't this be around for very long. If you're a player, you're like eight years. Yeah, exactly. Around, like, yes, I will do it. Right. Uh, it is until you start playing like Chelsea are right now and then you realise you're locked into... <laughs> moving to, on. Well, into moving the, on. Fingers crossed. That's, locked into yeah, 10 yeah, million. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm not feeling too sorry for them. Um, as I ponder my career options and think about the salaries that I could get as a Premier League player yeah, with your wonderful yeah. team, um, when we see the numbers like 100k a week or like 200k a week or whatever that number is for salary, yep. like is that literally like that number? Is it broken up into, you know, because this is another thing I think just like clarity is often helpful for fans as well. Like, is it literally that number? Is it like appearance fee, goal, assist, you know, did X, Y, and Z today? Yeah, exactly. Was it a cloudy day? Or yeah. Like, yeah. Um, <laughs> Walk clothes. No, that, that is, the, the, the base salary is, is you know, 90% of the salary. So what is reported is usually what it is. Uh, some Do you have any open positions? in your club yeah we, we, be happy we, to take we, one of these we, we do come up the sun let's <laughs> let's trial it out you know what i mean i'm injured you're injured okay yeah. fine all right well we've got but, a couple of games i'll go. send crouch here yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 exactly i'll be, I'll, I'll be the free. robot dance I'll be yeah. free. i right. used to be a goalkeeper so i don't oh, you're doing one of those um, right i think nick's nick right. if you might, yeah. i'll be fancy but i'll be here by the way we were we were one we were we were one goalkeeper away from actually calling him up for the cup final because we had so many uh goalkeepers out unfortunately unbelievable God, um, that would have been something to see. But yeah. no, but ninety percent of the number is actually yes. There point. are appearance fees, there are goal fees, there are assist fees. Uh, the agents do a very good job at sort of putting some add-ons. So yeah, the, the, but the number is mostly that. Our agents generally pretty good to work with. They in in movies they get a very difficult rap. Generally, and this is me saying, not you, but they're considered challenging sometimes and transactional. Well, I mean. Look, how, how do I put this one? Look, thank, my best answer is thankfully I have a, a, a sporting director, sort of Dan Ashworth Scalibur, yeah. so I don't really have to be dealing with this anymore. Um, but, you know, their, their job is to get the best result of their client for sure. their client. And we're conscious and our job is to get the best result for our, for our football team. But we have such seasoned executives now with Darren, uh, uh, Darren and Dan and, and Steve that they, they can handle it. How does owner, sorry for just say. I keep going. How does own it like interact with exec? And what I mean by that is like, do you guys have like a weekly checking call and do a strategy session? 
Like, because obviously the exact team do day to day. Yep. What's that interaction like? Well, my co-owner Amanda and Amanda, they, I mean, they're heavily involved in the day to day yeah. operations. The club they do have done a magnificent job uh, from day one, where we didn't have all the the infrastructure because the takeover happened so suddenly. So they really stepped in and and really plugged the gaps until we could bring in all the high caliber execs, which take time to bring. In. They've got they're contracted to other clubs. We've got to approach them officially and properly. Um, but now as a board, so it's done through the board. So we have regular, regular board meetings and then regular sub board meetings as well. Um, and sort of we work with the executives to sort of shape the strategy. Um, and sometimes be more intense during a transfer period. There'll be a lot more calls or during a big commercial discussion, maybe over a sponsor or, or how we approach sort of the Premier League on something. There'll be a lot more intensity from the board and from from owners. But otherwise, you have to trust the executives you bring in. They've done mm-hmm. such a good job for us so far that we're happy to work through the executives uh, going forward. I, it was Steve Pagliuccio on the show who said the hardest time as an owner is when you have uh, the press and the fan base on you to change your management and to change your teams. And it's whether you kind of uh, succumb to that and say, okay, like, you know, we're going to do it and please the public or say you're wrong. And actually, we're going to stick to our strategy. I'm sorry. How do you think about whether or not to succumb to public pressure when the whole tsunami is saying, you know, we the want to... The tsunami yeah. the the is a very <laughs> powerful army. Yeah. <laughs> and so they're saying, hey, we don't want, you know, X to play. Or we want, you know, X manager to be fired. How do you think about that? So, it's, you know, it's easier said than done, but I think I think you have to be... Uh, I think you, you have to show... A little bit of backbone in those situations, you know, and 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 sometimes situations won't go so well. I think it's important to stick to the strategy. Look, a lot of fans have, you know, share the same concerns as owners. So if there is a genuine need for a change or yep. something, you know, then owners should be prepared to do that. But I don't. I think we think if you have a long term strategy, you've got to be tolerant of ups and downs. Yeah. You know, look at Liverpool. You know, they, they, they've competed at a very high level. Uh, for many years, they didn't have such a great season, but yet they've they've kept the the show together. And I, I think it's important to realise that you know things can go up and down, and, and you know as long as you continue to evolve and continue to understand, I think you should stick to your long term plan. Yeah. Unless the change is is very much needed. Um, so look, understanding fans' concerns is definitely an important job, um, but it's not the only sort of uh, requirement for making changes and things like that. I think it has to be uh, make sense for the totality of the football club. Yeah. Do you, you know, when setting these expectations, do you look at other clubs and not naming names? But do you look at? I'm sure you name names. Do, uh, do you look at how a, a kind of a short term project like a Chelsea, let's say, who's <laughs> I didn't last names. long. Yeah, thank God you didn't name names. Yeah. Like, well, you know, I'm, and I'm actually talking about the years, of, uh, the 20 years, let's right. say, of a Roman Abramovich, mm-hmm. where you know the consistency of a uh, Liverpool and a Jurgen Klopp or something was very different. It was a, a, a they kept winning, then whoever yep. the management really was, or you know, I'd imagine that's quite a, a, a specific scenario. And I can't think of many alternatives. No, like neither that, can I. But... Uh, you know, but in the end, that that was their long term strategy. Yeah, was just maximum maximum impact all the time, uh, and no tolerance of any uh, failures. Yeah, uh, I'm not entirely sure, especially in the world of FFP today, whether that uh, model is sustainable in the years going forward, especially with more scrutiny on finances and things like that. But you can't argue for for Chelsea for for that mm-hmm. period of time and with the trophies they won, there there was a method to their madness. It's not one that I particularly want to emulate. I, I like calm, you know, uh, calm and stable uh, businesses. And you um, chose to buy a football club. <laughs> <laughs> so I chose to, we chose to buy a football club. Um, Very rational. You know, within yeah. within the context yeah. of a mad football club, I think you're to have some sort of of calm and long term thinking is. Uh, probably a better strategy albeit it was a successful one for Chelsea do you apply that to arena racing as well definitely we've been owners of arena racing for you know over 15 years and racing like football is a, is an emotional thing you know we have millions of people go through our race courses and they want to understand you know okay we understand it's a business but what are you doing for the benefit of the racing what are you doing to elevate uh, the product to elevate the the fan experience um and so both football and racing share actually a lot of common denominators um the grassroots are very passionate about the future of their sport. There was a lot of skepticism on us when we acquired racing. We continued to buy up a, uh, a sizable amount of the racing British racing industry um, about what we were going to do. A lot of people thought we were just sort of 
mad real estate developers and i'm, I'm saying no we, we <laughs> yeah. like we like the sport we understand content we understand yeah. that that's a, a lucrative thing we understand we understand that if for, for for us to be successful racing has to be successful and so i, I think now sort of we've got the balance right which is a better business football or racing like throws off more cash well, look, yeah, we've, well. owned, we've, owned, we've owned well we've owned uh, arena racing uh, for around 15 years and we put a lot of investment in so it would be a bit surprising if that was if uh, Newcastle United were done over 18 months so those up more cash than but arena are the quantum's very different uh, look at the end of the day they're both have as, as important as the uh, as racing is which which without it there is no business it's also a content uh, distribution sure. play. there are uh, you know, we, we own a, a racing channel with uh, Sky. It's a joint venture called Out the Races. Um, it's quite a Sky Sports Racing as it's been renamed. And the website gets millions of people mm -hmm. and views. So, you know, in, in, in the world of, of television, when everything is on demand, you know, when, when's the last time you guys t you know, turned in, you know, to Sky Movies next Tuesday to watch, you know, The Gladiator? Okay. So, no, but the only thing you're, you're tuning into is live sports and live news. Yeah. So the power of live is so important. It's the only thing television really has yeah. left. And so sports is such a big part of that. And that's why I think both can be uh, a big uh, financial. Uh... One thing I find fascinating is actually kind of when you look at the genres on TikTok, like football kind of highlights clips, like celebration moments, all kind of any form of short form video has been huge in terms of kind of inspiring another generation and new demographics to football. Do you worry about that with racing? Like, it's not like, yeah. oh, yeah, seven-year-olds getting hyped on yeah, TikTok exactly. videos about racing. Like, do you know what I mean? I, yeah. I'm, what I'm essentially yeah, really yeah. difficult is I'm positioning racing yeah. as the MLB, which right. is like baseball. You know, the race guys are just going to yeah. die off. <laughs> well, you yeah, know pretty much. Uh, yeah, you know like, what? The, the, the numbers don't don't show that, actually. The numbers show, no, I think if you have a love, uh, you clearly weren't, uh, but I'm a love of racing. You do, it's, it's, you do instill that into your... Uh, to your family it's probably less prevalent than football but you know kids early on have uh, memories of going to the Grand National with their with their dads and their mums and you know it is and still there is a huge racing community yeah. and I do think they do a good job it's it definitely easy. is more rural yeah. but it definitely do a good job of passing it on do you think there's more I mean on what you said again around live content and and then the content that we really all generate now do you think there is opportunity to open up racing in more of the ways that we have done with formula one or yeah. with you know football as we're definitely I, 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 absolutely because it is so interesting yeah. it's such a historic sport and what about ride to survive are, are, are you pitching that yeah, uh, yeah? yeah. i've got my, two producers that, that right my, here that was my elevated pitch. i like it like follow right, the job right. on... ride to survive yeah. ride survive can, no, can, can I can, yeah, can we edit that and that becomes yeah, my yeah, idea? Yeah, yeah. I need a good one. Take it. Uh, take that okay, you know, I'm yeah, taking yeah. that. I think yeah. it'd be fascinating. Like, if Harry Tracy like, facing a jockey yeah. and having yeah. actually a camera on yeah. the horse yeah. as well. Am I, am I taking this too far? No, no it'd, it'd be, be great. great. Like, yeah. Go yeah. yeah, like uh, and understanding um, sort of the strategy yeah. uh, behind the racing yeah, would be great. Fascinating. You know what? I agree. Yeah, thank you. I like it. I'm here all week. Right, guys. Cancel that out. Yeah. We'll get, yeah. yeah, I'm here all <laughs> week. I think that'd be really cool. Though. Yeah, I agree. But I think look, the concept it, it is there, right? Because right. now we're just talking about access. Literally, in three months, there's now going to be a show. Right. Up. Yeah. <laughs> Best idea I've ever yeah. had. Yeah. Should we call Scooter? After yeah, that? exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. Right. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. Unfortunately, he'll take our idea. There yeah. we go. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I just we kind of cut short just on the management bit, but it is something I really want to touch on because I think it's been. Yeah it seems so important to the success that you've had. And it was the appointment of Eddie Howe at yep. the start of the project. And what you saw as kind of an ownership and a leadership in, in what he brought to the club, because again, from an outside perspective, it was a surprise. It, was, it wasn't a name that maybe lots of people were associating with that position. And how you kind of run that process as an ownership to really make sure you have the person that fits what yep. you see as the right vision moving forward. Yeah, well, we when we when we took over the club, uh, sort of the the fan base and the 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 incumbent manager sort of didn't didn't get on particularly yeah. well, and, and I think <laughs> definitely we all agreed it was a, a good move to make a change quite early on, yeah. um, and we ran quite a detailed process. We 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 appointed Graham Jones our caretaker manager, so it gave us a bit of room, even though we were under pressure, we wanted to make the right decision. And we interviewed very high caliber managers, and we came close to appointing very high caliber managers. I think what stood out from Eddie Howe's interview, which captivated the entire board, was just how well prepared he was uh, for that interview. Can I, so the board sit in like the boardroom and then they come and present their plans? For, how does that actually work? Yeah, it, they literally exactly like that. Really? Yeah, it can be on Zoom or it can be on, uh, and, and, and we, you know, we have friendly chat and then, and then 
we ask questions, they give an opening, uh, talk about how, how what they see as a vision of the club, what the immediate concerns they need to address. And then they go on to a longer term. And I, what I remember, he was he he talked to generals where gen, he talked specifically, where everybody else was talking more generally. And for where we were in the league, um, it, it really resonated with us. He, he would use players' names that we have, not just a centre back. He would use the specific name or a centre midfielder. And he was so well uh, rehearsed and so well. He came with such level of knowledge and so prepared. We all immediately felt very comfortable with him. And obviously. He's been a tremendous hire for us. He's just a great person and a great coach. So uh, I'm happy we got that decision right. How does that decision making work? You will say like, yes, like you know, thumbs down. Uh, we, make, we make the decision as a board and we discuss it openly. We've, we've only ever had unanimous board uh, uh, decisions passed. So clearly we're like-minded as a board, uh, right from, from the chairman to me, to Amanda, my dad. So I think um, I think we, 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 we definitely a like-minded board and yeah we all thought he interviewed fantastically well and, and was the right man for the job we're very happy we got him and, well, and i will show you a, a whatsapp offline where i when we were first looking at the club where his name came up on my really? whatsapp yeah to murder exactly so we take the credit well i'm not, you know, I'm not i wouldn't dream of that but make sure that's included yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> someone's got to take the credit yeah. because look i mean look at where we are yeah. now it's, yeah uh, it's a great yeah, time it's to, all down to, to to eddie and his team i have to say to be talking about yeah well I, i've got one more and it's just like again maybe the, the finance mind here but like when we think about like football pricing in years to come you know, we were talking before and you said about kind of large swathes of the population that haven't actually engaged with premier league football and a lot of content like sporting content that we have like are these clubs going to be worth 10, 20 billion dollars? Is there a cap on their pricing? Because as we said, there's a lot of room to grow in terms of audience and you know uh, adoption from new audiences. Where's the ceiling, do you think? Well, it's a good question. Um, definitely, there's a huge amount of growth. We spoke on half the world not really being exposed hugely to the mm -hmm. Premier League. So there's a huge opportunity in that. I mean, we'd have to look to, we can look to the US to some of the franchise values um, what is the commanders was it just sold for or, or is being sold six yeah, billion dollars so, or yeah. something so uh, uh and nba teams are, you know there's no not an nba team less than three two yeah. three billion dollars today it doesn't matter where you are in, yeah. uh, in terms of uh of how you're playing and they're relatively domestic and they're relatively to... domestic and so you can imagine that to have sort of one of the best franchises in the most uh, talked about watched sporting league in the world um so are they overpriced or are we underpriced? <laughs> uh, you know, you, you, you're the you're the you're the VC. You're going to have to tell me uh, uh, if you've seen any invention in the last few years. It's that we're not pricing experts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> then I think it's right. good to yeah. admit your flaws. Put it out there. Put your flaws out there. Yeah, the show is good. It was very open. Right. So um, yeah. I think there's a big disparity, isn't there, between we're saying that you've got a Premier League club at 150 million, you've got a Premier League club at 6 billion. I'm not sure you have that within, maybe, yeah. maybe I, I, this, I don't know, I don't have the stats, but I'm not sure you have that in the same way. But, you know, at the same time, if I guess if you said you'd buy an NFL or an NBA team 20 years ago for the prices of, uh, you know, 150 million now, you're, you're, taking, you're laughing. The difference is right. you're talking about franchise systems, aren't you, security. Sure. You, know, you know that those teams are going to be playing yeah. in the league and, you know, you're, you're buying football clubs without yeah. the same security mm -hmm. attributed. Um, yeah. So it's slightly different, I guess, isn't it? But, yeah, that is a nuance there that you do have security of, of your... A recurring mm -hmm. um, top top yeah. league uh, playing, but you know, I I, I think that I, I look. We're going to see what Manchester United sells for. Yeah. Yeah. We saw what Chelsea sold for. Uh, I think you, we'll, we'll see a, a common thread of these franchises continuing to go up. And then, and then, final one from me, I promise. Like, do we find it a bit sad? that you know American P houses or large American finances in whatever way are kind of eating up the English Premier League and there's a chance that we lose the authenticity of the Toon Army and the, and the heritage that we have because American financiers are buying our leagues. I think, I mean, really look at you can look at Wrexham and Ryan Reynolds I and mean, yeah. there's no authenticity lost there. So I think it depends on the owner, mm -hmm. uh, whether American or from Middle East or from LATAM. Uh, I think if they embrace the culture uh, of the of the club, uh, it doesn't matter where they're from. And I think 
uh, P guys, just as well as private investors can be very good for the league. They come with great ideas, they come with financial discipline, and they come with, uh, with uh, expertise as well. So they can elevate the league too. Um, it depends on, on the owner. Um, and so I think I would we'd welcome financial investment from any quarter, as long as they were they understood that the you know the fans and the community have to come first. It was probably I mean that was back to your earlier point, wasn't it? It was about the process that you have to go through even when looking at these clubs and making sure you are aligned to that. Yeah. Do you find um that there is any time where the the commercial opportunity comes into conflict with the fans? And I'm gonna I'll use oh, something like question. I'll use something like a uh, yeah. stadium naming rights. Yeah. Tool. As an example. Yeah, look, I think that fans generally appreciate now more than they ever did the the financial impact on it. So the more commercial uh, revenue you bring, the more you can invest in the team. Yeah, uh, I think that that's understood more broadly amongst fan base across the league. Um, and so, yeah, that you've got to respect the heritage of the club, and you've got to respect the heritage of. Uh, institutions and, and and things that have been there for you know hundreds of years, hundred years. Uh, but I do think if you communicate and demonstrate that, yeah, well, we're doing this in order to do this, I think uh, fans on the whole will, will understand that, and yeah. I think they want the best for their club. And being in a financially uh, strong position, you know, is paramount to sort of investment in the team and getting the results and and, and bringing them the success that they they're craving. Yeah, but if it brings another Alexander Isak, they're probably happy. Um, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Good you on. ready to do a quick fire round? I think it's probably time, isn't it? Do you want to start? You, you go first. Well, my, my first one on any quick fire round, which we wanted to yeah. ask, was the best hospitality in the Premier uh, League at the moment. Where do you best enjoy going? We're we talking about the prawn sandwiches or the atmosphere? I mean, we're talking about prawn sandwiches. We're talking about the bar. We're talking about the atmosphere. Package it up for me. Uh, I, I'm a loathe to, to, to give my friend Josh Cronkett any, any sort of... Uh, uh, credit here, but I, the hospitality at Arsenal was pretty delicious. Yeah. Why? What makes it so good? I, I, you know what? I, I think they. Uh, it, it's a good spread. It's the Raymond Blog Association. Yeah, isn't it? yeah it's, <laughs> it's a good spread. Yeah, I looked at that. I think God, we're, Newcastle, we're going to get up there now. Okay. Yeah. Right. What was the worst hospitality? <laughs> I won't mention the 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 specific uh, name, but it was early on in uh, in ownership when we went to an away game. Mm. And uh, there was, it was either vice chairman or there was a, uh, a member of the board of the opposing team. We were sitting, it's a smaller stadium, that I gave it away. And there was a, a member of the board sitting in front of us and he was furious at some of the decisions the referee was making and sort of like turning to us as, uh, so I actually had to swap seats with Amanda. <laughs> yeah, to stay closer to him. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and funnily enough, uh, yeah. And, so as, as, and then he came up to uh, Newcastle, I think the following season or something. Couldn't have been nicer as well. So it shows what football can uh, can do to you. So passionate. Yeah, passionate. Passionate. Oh, yeah, I can say that. Uh, what about your sporting idol? Oh, I, I, I got to give you more than one. Okay. Uh, top three. Tiger Woods. Oh. Uh, Michael Jordan. Um, I'm a big boxing fan. He is the one he went. I actually really respect. I grew up watching him. I slept all night to watch his fights. Lennox Lewis. Yeah. He's like his. Because he wasn't the most exciting, but he would win every match, and I, 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 I loved his ruthlessness. Um, I got to give you a football. I, you know what? I'm going to play to the crowd. It's got to be Alan Shearer as well. Oh, so there brilliant. we go. There we go. Yeah, still holding the uh, all important record. Yes, I, I exactly. Really thought Celestine Babiaro might make an appearance there. Celestine, yeah. yeah. Well, he was number two. Well, it, was right. just, it was a close number. Good two. for you that you know uh, you Celestine Babiaro. Oh, exactly. I had top trumps and you know, shootout cards. Just okay, it was the Panini stickers. Yeah, 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 yeah those Panini stickers. Yeah, oh, but now as a so rare right. investor, we are yeah. all on so rare. Exactly. Right. But if we could change one thing about owning a sports team or a football team, what would it be? Mm. I think, well, I mean, how about that? You, you, you've heard of player managers, right? Yeah. What about player owners? I mean, there, there was a, t there, there is actually the only live footage of me on, on uh, St. James's Park is nutmegging um, Murdad Gadusi, the co-owner of Newcastle <laughs> United. Yeah, it got quite a few views like, for me anyway. Um, and but you know we're all we're all good. And friends my dad was facing you, was he? Wasn't he was standing back with you? He, no, he, he was <laughs> he was he was really after the ball. It was it was humiliating for mm -hmm. him actually. Uh, I'm not sure he's ever he's never been the same again. Uh, but it was great actually. Uh, my dad Yasa and I had a kick around. It was uh, it was uh, it was um, it was a lot of fun. Brilliant. Next ten years for you, obviously outside of Champions League, Premier League. Let's go, you know, personal as well. I think I'm I'm intrigued by obviously we've mentioned Arena and, and Newcastle, but in the wider 
context is there other opportunities in, in yeah. kind of a sporting context that, that you can see on the horizon well i'll give you the newcastle but obviously newcastle next year we want to be competing at the top levels of football consistently and sustainably um for me personally look i love uh, i love business and i love sports and so i think there's a great opportunity to develop sporting interests not just in football and racing but maybe to extend to other uh, businesses as the demand for content especially sports content increases over the next few years i think it's a good place to be so I'm definitely looking for more sporting uh, investments uh, uh, across different sports. It's, it's normally good to finish on that one, but I'm just too intrigued. Yeah. Uh, you can sign any player in the world. Like I'm the ultimate sports agent, so I've got any player you want. Who do you sign for Newcastle today? I'm going to ask you guys to, to give your answer first to that, and then I'm going to give you... I'm buying time here. Oh. If I was buying... If I was looking at the team now, I'm um, buying anyone. It's hard again. Can, it be, can play, it be a play from you're history? Play, you're that will so save well. me a lot of, uh, you know, no, especially as our transfer targets come out immediately. No, uh, oh, okay, yeah, yes, fair enough. You don't, right, you don't, yeah. don't, don't want to be, no, no, be saying, right. I mean, if, if you're dream players in your transfer targets, then that's a good sign. Right. I like that. Okay. Any player in history then? Um, Who, yeah, if you could bring anyone in. You, who are the you, transfer you know, targets? You, 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 you know, you, well, I'll, I'll answer that too. Uh, <laughs> you, you know who would be great in this team today? Because we have two amazing Brazilian boys, uh, Bruno Guimaraes and Joe Linton. Yeah. Uh, any player from history, I'd love to add Pele into that. I know how much it would mean to those two. And then we'd have like a Brazilian outpost in Newcastle would be so fun. Brilliant. Mm. I mean, if, Luar, Luar. Yeah. Yeah. I, if I, I mean, I would be going... You know, let's get Kevin in next to Jolinton yeah. and, and Bruno and, right. and and really get that midfield cooking. I mean, oh it's doing pretty well at the moment. But. Right. We'll bring Shearer back. Bring Shearer back. Yeah. My goodness. Uh, you know what that, I take it back. It's Shearer. It's just see Shearer score a goal as sort of a, an owner of Newcastle United football team. The Galloway finger going, up, a yeah, finger yeah, up, going, running, running towards, towards the yeah, crowd. And Alex Ferguson's yeah. back. Yeah. You know what? That's what we're going for. Oh, that was brilliant. the most bizarre moment. I felt like I was watching an ABBA reunion act with yeah. you two with your finger up. Well, by the way, we really connected. Over yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Eyes locked. Yeah, yeah exactly. And we did it 260 right. times as well. So, yeah. I mean, you think you've seen it enough. Yeah. But, uh, no one's no, no one's really taken it on. Well, I mean, Haaland is a, is a is a different beast altogether. Well, he likes the uh, yeah sitting cross legged. Yeah, he the, does, the and he, yoga, whatever he it? does, he just smashes. Who would be your dream up. shirt sponsor? Are you like, oh, I'd love to have them. Are you, are you looking for a plug? It, it would obviously be 20, uh, 20 BC, but the... Um, no, I mean, that's very fine. Right, we're we're, we're sure. going to get past it's my shirt. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. well, the Harry Savings yeah. Association, yeah. No, that's <laughs> but seriously, who would you like to have? Uh, look, I, you know, we're, we're grateful for the support we've had from Castor. I think Nike, Adidas, these are all great people we'd love to be associated with going forward too. Castor was great. I mean, it's obviously taken off in much much yeah. more recent times than than the bigger sure. um, kit providers, but they seem to be doing an amazing job. Yeah, well, I mean, they, they, they're, they're doing a good job. I think there's been some complaints about sort of fans not getting their kits in, oh, in really? time yeah. and things like that. But, uh, but no, the, the... <laughs> we're, we're, like, we're lucky to have had Castor. They've been a good partner for over the years. I think yeah. Nike is, is, a, is a big uh, business, but there are others, you know, where we should David, we'll share a friend, Michael Rubin, yeah. Fanatics. Fanatics are an amazing business um and what he's doing there is amazing as well and they're really changing sort of mm. merchandise uh for american sports and actually i think that approach to sort of european yeah. sports as well could be exciting too so we don't quite know where we're going with it but uh definitely there's some really exciting names up there as in, i've loved doing this do you have any more questions because no no I'll, I'll leave the uh existing transfer if targets. you want to hire him you know tell I, I do want to hire him yeah, harry's, right. harry's in goal uh, okay harry's in goal but Jamie, right, how about the, how about you guys come up for a game all right you're in goal you take the penalty all right and i'll make sure the ball's correctly on the uh, uh correctly on the exact spot and okay, we should do, do bets on twitter we have a decent following on twitter okay we do bets on twitter let's do if that. i save it or not okay deal and I'll, I'll donate sure. well, to three home games left. So, guys, you you you, you let me know which one. If We've got three score, penalties. That's if, one each. What is the bet? It's, if right. you score, Deal. it's going to be a donation to charity. Yep. Okay. Donate 5K to charity. Done. Okay. Deal. I'm in on this bet, guys. Great. They just cut me out. Exactly. All right. So, what is the bet? I mean, you're quite important. So, right, actually, no, so, so you're betting. <laughs> I'm betting that I will save it. I'm betting I'll score it. Well, you've got and to give him odds. And no? where are you betting? I'm definitely betting I'll score it. I'll give you, I'll give you odds. We're both taking a penalty against you. <laughs> I think I'll save yeah. his now. No, I won't save yours. Oh yeah, oh, wow. yeah. Solid. Oh. This this one's a striker. Have, have, right. you, have you seen Jamie play? All right. So this is going on Twitter. This, this is, is a solid bet. This okay. Solid bet. Five k. Okay. Done. Done. Well done. Cheers, guys. All right. Cheers. Thank you very much. Well done.